This is a production of Cornell University. Excellent. Thanks for the introduction, uh, Jenny. Yeah, I'm going to spend some time with you talking uh, about more of a case study approach, I think, in New York in terms of uh, handling nitrogen dynamics, documenting and managing field nitrogen use for greenhouse gas reduction is the title. Since uh, Jenny told me that the audience today is quite diverse, I put up this agenda uh, and first start out with talking a little bit about what we do in our program here, the Nutrient Management Spear Program or NMSP, and set the stage real briefly about agriculture in New York and the regulatory environment we work in, and then talk about on-farm research and tool development in our program, and then dive into, for the core of the presentation, in two approaches, whole farm mass balances as a tool, for evaluation and field-based adaptive management for nitrogen. Let's dive in right away. My job, a little over 20 years ago when I joined Cornell, my job description said that I was to provide leadership for the Nutrient Management Extension Program for the College of Ag and Life Sciences at Cornell University, and that that program should improve growers and agriculture industry awareness of the crop nutrient needs, crop quality, management of organic wastes, environmentally sound nutrient management practices in general, and then overall soil fertility management. That job description is as relevant now as it was 20 years ago. The only thing I would change is the word waste. We are talking about resources and not waste. Manure is a tremendous resource um, and uh, has all the essential nutrients. So our goal is here to try to figure out how we manage that the best to benefit our crop production, our soil health, our soil resilience, and uh, reduce the impact on the environment. We have a website, a Nutrient Management Spear Program website, nmsp.calls.cornell.edu. If you're interested in looking at uh, uh, aspects that I'm talking about today in more detail, before I go on, um, I'm the speaker for the session here today, but for the last 20 years, I've worked closely together with Carl Zimmick, colleague from Pro Dairy, who transitioned to working uh, for Dairy Management Inc. now and is no longer with Pro Dairy. Um, we were very fortunate to hire uh, Kirsten Workman as a replacement for Carl Zimmick within the Pro Dairy program, and she and I are working together moving this forward now. Just want to recognize their contributions. All right, so the ultimate goal of our program is to have impact, to facilitate a change for the better. We want to develop and implement better management practices at the farm level, the field level, within field levels, uh, state level as well. Contribute to agriculture and environmental management policy in the state of New York. Strong believer that we need to talk to each other to develop the best possible uh, approaches. We want to engage farmers in on-farm research based on the recognition that if you can see for yourself that something does or doesn't make a difference, you're going to adapt much more quickly, uh, seeing as believing. And then the last uh, item here, I'll come back with one slide totally at the end of this presentation, but we find it really important that our undergrad and grad population is involved in thinking about solutions to environmental challenges, environmental agricultural challenges, and that we engage them in um, multidisciplinary projects, including research extension and teaching. So for those of you not familiar with New York, we are a predominant dairy state. Uh, New York is the fourth highest milk producer in the US. And uh, the dairy industry is really important to the economy of New York as well. We grow a lot of crops to support animal agriculture, and uh, one of those main crops is corn, corn for silage. There's also corn for grain. We have over a million acres of corn grown on an annual basis. We also have a lot of water resources in the state of New York, and we would like to keep that clean. Uh, we have an environmental footprint that we would like to reduce as much as we can, and we want to conserve carbon. So there are multiple environmental uh, aspects here I could make the list much larger, recognizing we need biodiversity and many other aspects of agriculture as well. But here are the key ones that we work on in, in our program. So to address the environmental footprint that includes nutrients, that includes 
greenhouse gas emissions. It includes looking at carbon cycling. I think we require a focus on precision management at all systems. That was brought up with one of the last questions asked uh, in, after uh, Armin's presentation. We want to focus on all system levels, the cows, the, the fields, uh, the storage, the manure storage, the, the feed storage, the bunks. We want to use technology as it becomes available, as it uh, is developed to increase production per resource use, output per unit of land, output per unit of investment. We want to match the crop needs with inputs given, establish feasible balances, feasible benchmarks, feasible uh, targets for any of the tools we develop, because that helps us measure how we are doing and it helps us document how we move forward. We want to engage everybody who wants to engage with us in on farm research, uh, given the power of doing uh, test trials at your own farm. And then the main thing is here, we need tools to become comfortable with management decisions, with management changes over time. So you need to develop tools to measure and monitor progress over time. I'm going to take you back real briefly to um, New York regulatory environments. Back in 99, this regulator in the state of New York, the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, released the first CAFO permit. CAFO stands for Concentrated Animal Feeding Operations. This permit relied heavily on Natural Resources Conservation Service standards. These are guidelines on, on particular aspects of farming. And the one that's most appropriate for us to work with and think about is the 590 Nutrient Management Standard. And this 590 Nutrient Management Standard refers directly to the Land Grant University guidelines. In a free translation, that sort of says that in terms of fertility management, how much nitrogen, how much phosphorus, how do I distribute that over the land base? These standards and this CAFO permit is referring back to develop guidelines at the Land Grant University, which is Cornell University for New York. If you look at that 590 standards and you do a quick search of the word Cornell, you will find it's referenced 93 times in this document, just to, to show the link between um, the, the regulatory environment and the science uh, supported, science um, driven recommendations as we develop them here at the Land Grand University. Right. Our website has access for folks that are interested in knowing what those guidelines are. There's one particular page that is specifically for uh, nutrient management, uh, CAFO planning, CNP planning. All right. We have on the website both the fact sheets and then that website for the Cornell University guidelines for comprehensive nutrient management plans, where people can find out what the relevant documents are in terms of, of guidance for nutrient management planning. All right. So we don't work in a vacuum. I mentioned uh, we team up with uh, our, our colleagues, uh, Kozomik in the past, and now uh, Kirsten Workman on on all of these issues. We work with a lot of partners throughout the state in New York, and we have officially recognized advisory committees, an internal advisory committee with Cornell Corporate of Extension educators, as well as Cornell faculty and staff, and an external committee that has um, our regulatory agencies, <clears throat> our state agencies, the Soil and Water Conservation Districts represented, the Northeast Dairy Producers Association, New York Farm Bureau, farmers are on this committee, consulting firms are participating, other SUNY institutes are participating. This is a committee that uh, is knowledgeable about agriculture and can give us feedback on what is practical, what is, uh, what is doable, what needs to be addressed, where are the barriers, what are the opportunities for moving forward. So just to outline what our, our uh, our mission is in our, our program and how we try to work together with our partners to actually um, execute that mission. All right, so on-farm research and tool development is really important if you wanna move forward with improved management. We try to build partnerships with an on-farm presence. The map on the left is one of our first projects that we started um, where we looked at how much phosphorus we needed. And every dot is a farm that participated with an on-farm trial. 
those type of networks are important to build um, so that we can draw conclusions, not just for an individual field, but across many farms for the state of New York. On the right of the screen, you see a snapshot of our website. There is uh, the on-farm research partnership website that has listed right now 12 active programs, active uh, projects. Um, and each of those has some more information if you're interested in diving into that. What type of things do we do? Well, manure was already mentioned. It's a big, a, a big source of nutrients. Uh, it could also be a problem if it's uh, if those nutrients aren't reaching the crops but are being lost in the environment. So we work with producers, consultants, custom operators on evaluation of equipment to apply manure as one way to reduce emissions and to increase nitrogen use efficiency. Manure injection studies, one example of that. We just got funded for a manure fertilizer replacement program. Um, New York Farm Viability and Northern New York Ag Development Program funded uh, trials that we're going to conduct with farmers throughout the state, where we look at the true value of manure in terms of nitrogen replacement value. So if we spread manure, do we still need fertilizer? And this is a nice example of showing that that is not uh, always the case. Manure has value. Uh, and the other thing that we want to identify here is what is the yield benefits of manure. So these type of studies uh, are very common for us to, to look at. We are working on crop rotations, keeping the ground covered, trying to assess uh, the benefits of cover crops for, for uh, nutrient uptake in the fall and credits in the spring. Expanding that to letting that cover crop over winter and grow for a couple of weeks so that we can harvest it as a first cutting. So crop rotations, we're looking at different crops. What are the options to keep the ground covered and increase productivity? We develop tangible tools or we uh, calibrate them if they're developed elsewhere. Um, examples here on the screen are the corn stock nitrate tests, the Illinois soil nitrogen test introduced a new buffer pH approach um, in our, our uh, lab facilities and a new sulfur test as well. Tangible things, soil analysis, plant analysis type stuff. But we're also looking at digital tools. And the focus here is accessibility. Here's an example of a, a publication we, we just put out last year, trying to see if we can use cameras on our cell phones to get a better sense of how much carbon and nitrogen is in the cover crop in the fall before winter in the spring before we terminate the stand. Technology use in terms of yield data is really important for us as well. Measuring yield is really important to making changes in management. If you keep guessing, it's difficult to be comfortable. So we've worked with, uh, with farmers um, who have yield monitoring equipment or work with custom operators that have that to look at their raw data, apply a cleaning protocol. So we take out the errors in these maps and then turn it into yield stability zones that tell people that, okay, in the green areas, I'm consistently high yielding. In the red areas, I'm consistently low yielding and green and, and uh, sorry, blue and yellow are variable over years, one year high, one year low, very much subject to the weather. We're now at the most advanced stages of, uh, of looking at yield monitors, working with satellite and drone imagery. See, can we, can we make this type of yield assessment accessible for more people? Particularly the satellite imagery has promise for that. The last one is a quick update in terms of tools. Um, we develop guidance documents guidance on groundwater protection, guidance on nitrogen leaching index assessment. Um, one of the more recent ones that we developed was the phosphorus index. And I'm just showing this to show you the collaboration that goes into developing the guidance. This was working with all our partners in the state, farmers, farm advisors, agency folks, large databases, 30,000 fields that we were able to tap into. Uh, 30 farms with whole farm information, two planner surveys, get feedback from the planning community, uh, evaluation of impact. All of these together resulted in the release of a new tool that is now being implemented uh, on farms in New York. Just a slide, we're not gonna talk about phosphorus, but just a slide to show the partnerships that are required for building these type of guidelines. 
All right. Let's dive into two tools. The first one is the whole farm mass balance tool. Before I actually explain what that means, I wanted to share this slide. This is from Jim Camberato, colleague out of Purdue, uh, a statement that was made in their uh, nitrogen management update last year. And in here it says, remember that nitrogen use in corn is part of a complex biological system that interacts with everything under the sun and is difficult to model with computer programs. We cannot accurately predict the weather. We cannot accurately predict soil and supply or availability throughout the year, yet we cannot afford financially or environmentally to simply apply more than enough. And this to me summarizes our current um, understanding of nitrogen cycling, the diversity. Armand's presentation was a, a, a really great example of how complex all these, these things are and how difficult it is to have a single solution for all of this. It also points out the importance of developing tools that help us evaluate how well we are doing and learn over time. So the neutral mass balance, one of those tools. This is a tool at the whole farm level. In this particular approach, so a systems, sort of a systems accounting approach, we look at the farm and we draw a boundary around it and we say, what is coming onto this farm in terms of nutrients? Feed fertilizer, the primary two ones on our, our dairy farms. Uh, there might be some animals coming onto the farm and some farms are importing bedding material, straw. We also have nutrients that leave the farm in terms of exports. Milk is the prime export for dairy farms, but there are also farms that export crops. Some farms export manure and there might be some animals leaving the farm. You take the difference between imports and exports, you get the balance. And this is on a nutrient, pool of nutrient basis. We can divide that balance in terms of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium that we're using now per total amount of land that the farm is cropping. So per tillable acre crop land. We can also divide it by the total amount of milk that the farm produces. And those are the two key indicators per tillable acre is a reflection of do we have the land base to recycle the nutrients. The per hundred weight is more of a production efficiency number and both are important. We had the opportunity to work with a lot of farms over the last many years. And back in 2006, we had a database of about 100 and, 102 farms that we were able to analyze and say, Okay, what, what's reality for these farms? What are we doing? What are the opportunities? Based on that evaluation, we set uh, feasible limits, feasible balances. And for nitrogen, that feasible balance was between zero and 105 pounds per acre. If it's less than zero, it means we're mining our resources. Not a good thing. If it's greater than 105, it's signaled in this database that the farms might have had opportunities to improve their balances. And knowing that the biggest drivers are feed and fertilizer, improving balances meant addressing um, their feeding program and addressing their fertilizer program. Opportunities to reduce balances driven primarily by feed and fertilizer decisions that are being made at the farm level. So this particular assessment by working with the farms, by the farm sharing their data with us, we were able to evaluate a statewide database and give some guidance as to, you know, where, where, where should we strive to be? For nitrogen, our range right now is between zero and 105 pounds of nitrogen per acre. Exceeding that is a signal that it might be possible to reduce those balances, save some money, and reduce the environmental footprint and greenhouse gas emissions because anytime you over fertilize, you increase the amount of loss to the environment. So those numbers in a table look nice, but it's much more visible if we have a figure for this and we have. Here is a example of a whole bunch of farms with their balances. Here's the milk per acre and here is the milk per, sorry, here's the milk per acre and here's the balance per acre, the nitrogen balance per acre. I set one zero to 105, that's this, this box, this blue box. Every farm that's in here, in the blue box, is meeting the feasible balances per acre. 
Now we also want to look at production efficiency. That's equally important. And production efficiency is in this diagonal. So the yellow triangle reflects the farms that are more most efficient in terms of balances per hundred weight. They have the lower balances per hundred weight. If you overlay blue and yellow, you get the green box. And that green box, box is where farms meet both the feasible balances for balance per acre and a balance per hundred weight, in this case, in the example of nitrogen. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, this allowed us to visualize our farm results and to start looking at if the farm comes back and you're here somewhere, 250 pounds per acre for the same amount of milk, um, that farm might have opportunities to improve. Farms that participate in this assessment now are getting a report. They fill in the input sheet, it's four pages. It's ask basic information about how much fertilizer was imported, how much feed was imported, what is the milk export and things like that. And they get the farm back with uh, boxes, nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium is what we're reporting on right now. For this talk, nitrogen was the focus. So let's take a look here. This is the nitrogen balance, a pound per acre again, and the milk production. And a farm gets their dot in this figure somewhere. In the example here, it's in the green box. They get it for all three nutrients. In addition, if they participate for a longer term, they get their trends in the same report. So these are the trends for the balance per acre for nitrogen, uh, for phosphorus and potassium again. And um, some farms you can really, well, a lot of farms actually, you can really see the improvements over time when you do this for multiple years. We will always see fluctuation in these balances. And that's driven by the weather. If it is a drought year, we have less yields, we have to import that drives up the balances. So you'll see later that we calculate with three year running averages for this. Same thing for the balance per hundred weight. This is uh, uh, the balance per hundred weight again for nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium. Also important uh, to look at those, those trends over time. In addition to their balance figures, the green box figures and their trend figures, the farms get a opportunity table. This is uh, what we currently have in the opportunity table. It lists the farm balances in lines one and two and compares it to benchmarks that came out of our research database. So here's the 105. If the farm exceeds the 105, which it does in this example, it gets flagged. So everything that's flagged in here is exceeding what we established as feasible balances. And this is not a hard cutoff. This is basically saying that, for example, if your animal density exceeds 1.0, it's more difficult to be in the green box. It's more difficult to meet the balances if you don't export manure. So this is a, an example farm was high on nitrogen. Um, one of the things that jumps out is the purchase feed is exceeding the feasible balances. This could trigger a, attention by the farm to say, okay, what are we exactly feeding? Do we need all of it? Where are the losses? All right. Feed and fertilizer, as I mentioned, are typically the biggest drivers for balances. So the opportunities are also in addressing feed and fertilizer decisions. Now, if you do this type of uh, analysis with a lot of farms, you can start pulling their information together. And this is again, the beauty of farm sharing their information with us. We can do trend analysis at watershed or state levels. And we did that for the upper Susquehanna watershed, part of the Chesapeake Bay, and for, the, for New York state. And what this is really showing very illustratively is that if we start measuring things, we start making better decisions. We had reductions in total NNP imports comparing 2004 to 2013 when we did this assessment of 66 million pounds of nitrogen in the state of New York, not applied in 2013 compared to 2004. 6.6 .6 million pounds of phosphorus not applied in 2004, not imported onto the farms, not used at all, not brought in. So if you don't bring it in, you can't lose it. These are tremendous reductions, 25 to 30%, depending on what, what watershed or state level we look at, about 20% for phosphorus, enormous reductions, simply not importing it anymore 
if we don't need it. And we did not give up on milk production. We did our crop production actually slowly increased. All right, that was an example of an evaluation tool at the whole farm level. Farms that participate do this around this time of the year. They fill in the forms, they send it to us. We either give them their report back. Um, it doesn't specifically tell you what to do in terms of decision making. It just points out some direction of opportunity. Is it the feeding side or is it the, uh, the um, fertilizer side of things? Right, so there's plenty of room for follow up questions once people get their reports back. We are working with a more recent data set uh, of three years. We have about uh, 50 farms in that database where we have a consistent three year timeline for all of them. And uh, we are evaluating that for um, additional indicators that we could add to this opportunity table. Looking for more key performance indicators that can help farms identify where the opportunities are and monitor change over time. All right, I want to spend a little bit more time now on, on the core of, of uh, nitrogen management at the field base. As was already pointed out, nitrogen is, is difficult to manage. It has the potential to escape on us in one form or way, whether that's nitrates or N2O or NH3. Um, but as Jim Camarado said, we cannot just afford to apply enough, uh, just enough to make sure we just have enough. And instead of that, we need to be more comfortable with making decisions about when do I need it? And when do I don't need it? How much do I need if I do need extra nitrogen? And when I also state up front that a malnourished plant is a leaky plant, we under fertilizing is is not the way to go. If we impact plant health, we impact the plant's performance, everything else you can imagine in terms of the whole farm mass balances. If I can't grow homegrown forages and I have to import those, that has a much larger environmental footprint, both for nutrients and greenhouse gas emissions. All right, so we're gonna focus on um, adaptive management policy, but before I dive into this, I uh, wanna, bring up this equation. This is equation that is the foundation of recommendations coming out of Cornell University land grant system. We basically uh, say that um, a, a, a good target to shoot for in terms of nitrogen requirements for corn is a function of what we expect the yield to be, yield potential, what we expect the soil to supply through soil organic matter mineralization, soil and component here what we expect to get from crop rotations. And it's listed here as salt, but it could, it could be cover crops. It could be a previous year hay fields, or it could be soybean credits. And then we recognize that there is such a thing as fertilizer uptake efficiency. Not all of the fertilizer we apply can be taken up. And we take that into account. We also have uh, the dairy industry in the States, manure again as a tremendous nutrient source. So we take that into account with our recommendation system as well, crediting both current and past years manure applications so that we lower the amount of uh, nitrogen we recommend if there's manure in the system. So back in 2000, when the first CAFO permit came out and uh, regulations came in place, Farmers in New York that fall under these recommendations, uh, at least these uh, regulations, had two options. They could use a corn yield potential that was in our yield database at Cornell. That's a database I inherited when I started working at Cornell. And the equation that I just showed you. So they would look up the soil type, look up what the yield potential for that soil type was listed as, plugged it into equation, and then derive the recommendation. The second option that was put in place by state partnership was that they could use their own yield data. If a farm had three years of yield data, they could substitute the book values for their own yield data. And this reflects that book values are always off one way or another. The, if you have your own data, it was highly incentivized to use your own data to derive recommendations. 
thanks to a partnership of farmers and crop consultants uh, in the state and custom harvesters in the state, we, over the past five years, have been able to pull together an enormous database of crop yield data for corn. So a quick update is that we now have a new yield database. Um, we were able to analyze uh, about 230,000 acres of corn yield data. Uh, that does not include 2001. This is the summary up until we're still working on 2001. Um, and from this database, we're able to generate a new database for corn grain and initiate a database for corn silage as well. That database is currently under review and testing. But open up the door for us to do something new. And in my view, really constructive in terms of rules and regulations in our land grant mission was the introduction of the concept of adaptive management in the state in in the NRCS federal policy at the federal level NRCS in 2011 natural resources conservation service released agronomy tech note number six on adaptive nutrient management and it was an update uh, in 2013 of that same document and what this basically opened the door for was on-farm testing as a way to make improvements over time rather than fixed values. And the, the circle here on the right of the screen is sort of you, you take stock of what you have, step one. You plan for some management change to be evaluated. You implement that evaluation. Step four, you look at the results of you, that you got. Step five, you act on those results and make changes. So it's it's the process of continuous improvement through measurements, through experimentation in one sense or another. The original document of NRCS stated that the experimentation uh, could include nitrogen rate studies to determine the optimum end rate and had to be replicated at least four times. In New York, we got together with the agencies um, and talked about how we could implement something adaptive management related in New York. And we released two fact sheets, fact sheets 77 and 78, back in 2013. That uh, adaptive management process was uh, updated with uh, input of our external advisory committees in 2018. And farms that are regulated now have four options, basically. You can use the book values. You can use your own yield data. And a lot of farms are beginning to collect those. Or you can take the uh, adaptive management approach that could include replicated nitrogen rate trials, but it could also include the evaluation of a management change uh, in a different way. And it's the last bullet point that I think is most important here. Farms can now take the adaptive management approach and evaluate if a change in management um, makes a difference. But as soon as they do that, they have to start measuring yields and do an environmental assessment to see if that higher nitrogen rate was really needed. The tool that was uh, introduced at that time as, as uh, an adaptive management tool. So if you want to do adaptive management, you need evaluation tools. The first tool that was introduced was this corn stock nitrate test, where you take a piece of the sample at harvest time, you analyze it for nitrate, and then you look at the numbers and say, the, the policy says that if the results exceed 3000 PPM for two years, nitrogen rates need to be reduced with continued yield and season T monitoring until the season T's are routinely below 3000. This is an adaptive management approach. You keep measuring and dialing in until it's in the it, 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 until it's below the 3000. The concept here is that at some stage, the yield levels off when you put fertilizer out or manure, whatever it is that uh, supplies the nitrogen. From that moment on, the yield does not increase anymore, but the stock levels do increase. And therefore, this is a really useful test in terms of adaptive management and of season evaluation tool. Since 2018, there are some other options. So the CSNT is still in the list of options. Farms can use that. We recommend to sample the top yielding area of a field. Um, there are also a couple of other options, including putting in a, a check strip with the control treatment. And then 
we have a fourth option here that I want to spend a few minutes about as, as well. The fourth option is to do a field balance. The field balance itself is basically supplied minus taken up. Um, there was an additional thing that was brought into the adaptive management policy in 2018, and that was saying if your farm with a three year running average is at or below 105 pounds per acre, break a balance, you meet the adaptive management guidelines and do not have to do any field specific evaluations beyond recording yield. So this is a tool, the mass balance now being incentivized through adaptive management policy in the state of New York. All right, so that field balance, coming back to that, we excluded corn at that time, uh, 2018, because we didn't quite know how to do it, but we have a better sense now. So we're working on that. What is a balance in terms of a field balance? It's simply an inputs or supply minus the output. So fertilizer, manure, rotation credits, soil, and we compare that to how much the crop actually took up and removed. Here's an example of one farm. Every bar you see on the chart here is a field on that farm. And there are two lines on this. The black line on the chart, well, let's take a look at the left. The black line on the left here is the total amount of nitrogen taken up by the crop in that particular field in that particular year. So this is uptake, yield times percent nitrogen. The blue line is the nitrogen supplied to this each of these particular fields. And we rank them from left to right based on the difference between those two numbers. On the left, supply and uptake are very close together in this example. On the right, they are very far apart. And if you want to take a look at the last four fields here, all of them are somewhere between, I don't know, around 250 pounds of nitrogen supply, less than 100 pounds taken up. If you see this and these are your fields, your immediate attention will go to these fields and say, okay, I obviously did not need the fertilizer here. Yellow is the fertilizer. Um, how can I improve on these fields over time? And these would signal for the most part that this line here, the black line with the yield, um, illustrates that nitrogen was not an issue, a crop limiting issue in these fields. We supplied more than twice the amount taken up here and the crop yield was lower than the fields on the left here. You can do these balances for available nitrogen that discount that manure is not 100% efficient. We can do it for total nitrogen where every pound of nitrogen in manure is added to the calculation. Reality is probably somewhere in the middle. We've done this for four farms now, two years of data. So these are all the same type of figures. What I wanna point out here is some opportunities. So we have, for example, this farm B here. Um, there are some fields here where the balance is negative. That's not sustainable over the long term. There are some, some questions there to be, be looked at, and maybe we, we might have an opportunity for increased yields here, maybe. On the right here, we'll see a whole bunch of fields where, again, the yield is among the lowest on the farm. It's really not nitrogen limited, and we have opportunities to save on our fertilizer expenses. So what we hope in terms of adaptive management, that farms are participating with the whole farm as balance and identify if they have opportunities for saving at the whole farm level, but also dive into more specific field-based management by evaluating at the end of the season. These are all end of season tools. We uh, cannot change what was done in the season with these tools, but we can evaluate how well we did and let that inform our decision-making moving forward. Farms that have yield monitors can do this type of balances also at the within field level and identify where areas are that they could do variable rate application within the field level. All right, I want to leave some time for questions here. So I'm going to focus a little bit on a, a summary and then one more slide on uh, another topic. So our program, Nutrient Management Spear Program at College of Ag and Life Sciences 
at Cornell University is tasked with the land grant mission in nutrient management for field crops in New York. We don't work in a vacuum. We have advisory committees we work with and we work in partnership with all the state agencies. We develop guidelines that we wanna be as science supported as can be, recognizing that especially for nitrogen management is a challenge and that we can strive to be better um, with what we do, but there's always gonna be uncertainty going back to the statement that my colleague out of Purdue made. So the guidelines are posted on this website. Um, our focus with the program is on development of practical tools for crop nutrient management and tools that allow for troubleshooting and evaluation. We basically look for tools that can tell us, are we on the right track? Are we going in the right direction? And can we show at the same time the progress already made at the, at the state level? Nitrogen is difficult to manage. Everybody will recognize that. I do want to point out, and it's often forgotten, that both under application, so not enough, and over application can result in problems. So finding ways to fine tune to better meet the needs of the crops over space, different fields, and over time, different seasons, different weather patterns is important. The adaptive management approach that we introduced in the state of New York is in my view, absolutely key in moving us forward. If we incentivize on-farm experimentation, we have a much more rapid impact. Um, and it's much easier for a producer to see that something can be changed. We gotta, we gotta be able to manage the risk and we gotta know where the risk is. So adaptive management is key. Um, Within that, you need evaluation steps. And this concept of freedom to explore in the adaptive management system. So farmers can overwrite the land grant guidance and apply beyond what was recommended with the freedom to explore and the responsibility to evaluate if that really was an improvement. It fits right with our land grant mission and our Cornell motto. Sharing of data allow us to document progress and to develop new tools as well. And we saw that when we developed the mass balance, the whole farm mass balance, feasible balances where we could base that on farmer, farmer input. Um, it is really, really useful for those databases to be pulled together uh, and to learn from them so we can figure out what is driving these balances and where we can make changes. Partnerships and incentive programs are really essential as well. Here in New York, we have in, in, in overall a really good partnership among the agencies, um, a good partnership with the planning community and the farmers in the state. <clears throat> and uh, we might not always agree, but we discuss and we are able to explore different opportunities. And our uh, shared documents are, are a result of that partnership. All farm mass balances are an evaluation tool at the whole farm level. It will help us um, identify if there's overall opportunities for improvement and give us some guidance, whether we should look at the cropping system or the feeding system or um, storage aspects of the farm. Uh, the adaptive management process that I talked about today in terms of field balances, in terms of C's and T's, uh, that is field-based or within field-based, um, an additional approach to becoming more comfortable with our manure and fertilizer decisions over time. If any of you on the on the call are in New York uh, interested in, in evaluating um, at the farm level, contact us. We are happy to work with anybody to uh, um, evaluate nutrient use at the farm level. Uh, and uh, listed here both the website and my, my email, as well as the screenshot of the on-farm research partnership again. This is the last slide. Not to forget that the future will need bright uh, minds to work forward with, because this is not gonna get less complex. We have to come up with, with solutions. We have to engage the next generation in 
finding solutions to ag and environmental management, coming up with better tools. So I just want to show this. We are on Twitter now. <laughs> and um, these are stories that were put out over the last uh, um, six months or so of students at Cornell, all associated with um, whole farm dairy sustainability aspects, precision ag aspects. And we have also launched uh, our PhD student, Agostino Liva on the program has uh, developed a curriculum for whole farm mass balances that is now being implemented in high school classes as well. Thanks to everybody that participated um, in uh, all of what I shared today. As I mentioned, when I started out, uh, I'm presenting it, but it's actually refracting partnership with a lot of folks um, in the state of New York and other states as well as we form national networks with many of our, our programs as well. And with that, back to you, Jenny. Thank you so much, Kareen. That was fantastic. As you know, I love your adaptive management work. <laughs> um, Jen, if you can put the poll out, that would be great. And I will start going through the questions. Um, please put your question in the Q&A box. So Mark asks, um, and this was early in your talk uh, with your strip, the strip project. Um, why would you need any manure or N fertilization in an alfalfa grass field since alfalfa is a powerful N fixer and also very effective in acquiring P from soil sources by a mycorrhizal fungi? Really good question. Um, I think uh, we need to recognize that manure has a lot of value and not just nitrogen. There is uh, phosphorus, sulfur, basically all of the 17 essential elements are in manure. And we, we tend to want to manage one single nutrient. Um, we can do that with manure, it has all of them. So there might be reasons for manure application to alfalfa fields to meet the phosphorus needs for that stand and reduce our phosphorus fertilizer imports. There might be a need for sulfur addition that we don't have to do if we apply manure to alfalfa fields. Now, typically farms would be applying manure to, if they apply manure to alfalfa, it would be in the later years when we could have potential for deficiency for phosphorus, for potash, for uh, sulfur. The other thing that shows from uh, many studies on manure is that it's a tremendous material to build soil health and soil resilience over time. So um, while the alfalfa itself does not need the nitrogen, it could benefit from the other nutrients that's in the manure and it will reduce its nitrogen fixation to a certain level um, when manure is applied. Cannot totally eliminate it, but it will reduce it to a certain amount. I hope that answers it. The next question, at 100 pounds of N per acre, positive balance. Is this not already a high risk of leaching, nitrous oxide losses, and unnecessary expense? Isn't the goal to get N balance close to zero while maintaining good production? Really good question. The, uh, th that's, that's a question that comes up more often. So a zero balance means that everything we import gets exported, that we have 100% efficiency. There is no biological system that is that efficient. It simply cannot be done. There are unavoidable losses in everything we do, agriculture included, our lives included. So we have to make sure that our balance is not negative, that it's not zero, that it is somewhat positive, but not excessively positive. And we are working towards trying to figure out what are the feasible balances? What can we do? Uh, what losses can we avoid? How can we capture um, nitrogen losses from the barn, from the storage, from, from the field? So we're, we're certainly looking at ways of trying to capture that better. Um, enhanced efficiency fertilizers were brought up earlier. That is one potential way of doing that, uh, making those, those loss components a little smaller. Um, so, yeah, no, we absolutely cannot operate in agriculture with a zero balance. That is impossible. That would mean that we export as much as we import. And with biological systems, that is not feasible. We can work towards 
better balances though over time. And that's that's why we worked with the feasible limits now and are working with farms that are over the 105, see if we can bring that down. Okay, thank you. So Emmeline asks, how can we connect the whole farm mass balance concept to newer metrics measurements on a farm like building carbon and reducing nitrous oxide emissions? Excellent question, Emma. Thanks. The um, project that we have a project ongoing right now on dairy sustainability key performance indicators. And in that project, we evaluate a number of tools that do whole farm carbon footprinting, greenhouse gas emissions uh, type tools. And what we're currently working on is trying to connect the end balance uh, from the whole farm mass balance with the estimations of greenhouse gas emissions from those tools. The concept behind it is that every time that we exceed crop needs, we open up the door for losses. And that's why it was so important to be able to document the reductions, the 66 million pounds of nitrogen uh, in imports, nitrogen no longer being used. So um, we are working on a project to try to connect those, the, the mass balance uh, footprints. Uh, the concept is if your balance is over the feasible limits, there will be uh, losses, including greenhouse gas losses, that we want to see if we can address connecting carbon footprints, greenhouse gas inventories with um, mass balances. Whether we are successful in that, we don't know yet, uh, but we're working with the farms to get the data collected so that we can evaluate that. Right. Um... And our water quality initiatives, right, began in 1999, so we've had a lot of time to work on it. So we have to give ourselves a little room to work through this scientifically. Okay, Jeff asks, comparison of nitrous oxide loss from daily spread versus injection of manure, and he says in spring. So our, our field trials, in, we, we had a long-term uh, study several years ago, where we looked at uh, greenhouse gas emissions from cornfields, uh, surface applied versus incorporated um, the, uh, versus fertilizer. And the main observation there was that the biggest driver for emissions was when nitrogen was applied in excess of crop needs. So the importance of the rate, trying to get the rate correct. When you inject manure, you capture more nitrogen you will have to reduce the rate for the same credits from that application. If you don't do that, you apply the same rate on the surface versus an injection, you will have increased the amount of nitrogen you capture. If that then exceeds the crop uptake, we have created a problem. If you adjust the rate to meet the nitrogen needs of the crop that follows, then injection is a really good way to move forward because it has all sorts of benefits, not just nitrogen, phosphorus also, in terms of reducing losses to the environment. We have a VR partner in the current uh, project that is uh, headed up by Dairy Management Inc. and the Soil Health Institute nationwide. Um, that project has field trials. So we are measuring uh, greenhouse gas emissions now with comparisons of different manure sources, injection, surface application, to get better answers, because this is actually an area that needs a lot more research. But to me, a key driver is, again, the rate. So if you can adjust the rate to meet the crop needs and not exceed them or undershoot them, we uh, have a good chance of reducing emissions. The other, the other thing, sorry, uh, the other thing in terms of uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions is increasing homegrown forages, growing your own crops, uh, reducing uh, the need for imports from elsewhere. So New York is in a pretty decent shape for that with our homegrown percentage. So Jeff asks uh, a follow-up. Is there a plan to measure soil biology, their mineralization of nutrients, and evaluating if changes in the biology will play a role in more environmental 
environmental production of crops. Yeah, so soil health includes microbiology, includes uh, biology in general, right? So there's, there's lots of things going on in, in our own team. We are very fortunate to have been able to uh, get an assistantship for a new PhD student in our program. Uh, she has a microbiology background and will be joining us in the fall semester to work on soil health related aspects of nitrogen management. So microbiology, absolutely important. We will be measuring that in our own program and there's lots of, lots of research going on and trying to better allocate, a better find or develop tools for, for actually assessing microbial dynamics because it is so much tied into that soil nitrogen supply number that is hard to predict um, and that we need to learn more about. So when does the soil supply enough nitrogen so that we can back off on our fertilizer applications? Okay, so Mark is having a follow-up question on um, the zero balance. So thank you. I agree that zero balance is risky and unfeasible for long-term sustainability. However, what is the potential for crop breeding for end cycling efficiency, the best soil health management practices reduce leakiness and hence reduce the needed positive end balance to say, um, it says 509 or 30 pounds uh, per acre saving more money and emitting less N2O. I suspect that means 50 or 30 pounds instead of 509. Um, yeah, so, so plant breeding, um, if you look at the, the crop yields in the, over time in, in many states, New York included, you'll see an upward trend. And that is a combination of better management, but also a, also a great contribution of plant breeding, generating uh, higher yielding crops with um, potentially reduced need for nitrogen uh, and better balancing of, of uh, nitrogen supply and uptake. So anything we do on the field side, plant breeding to create the potential for greater crop, uh, crop production, uh, as well as management to reduce disease weed pressure, whatever we need to do, keep the ground covered to keep the carbon, all of that good management is as important as it ever was. <laughs> okay, Kieran, I've got some quick fire questions for me, for you, from a more policy ended perspective on this. All right. How many farms are currently engaged in this whole farm? Um, it's a bit in a flux. I think we did uh, around, 80 or 90 farms okay. last year, it's probably gonna double this year. There's a great uptake right now. Okay, and so what is limiting the engagement of including more farms? Um, I, I think it's the, it's the basic record keeping part. Okay. Um, so it requires a little bit different record keeping. So then my next question was how much time should a farm set aside for sampling, uh, measuring, and meeting with you and and your and your cohort in order to go through this whole process. If someone were to do it on a year, like how much time would they need to set aside in order to manage for say nitrogen in the way that you're helping farms do that? All right. So for the mass balance, it's a simple four-page input sheet. If you have the records, it takes you less than two hours to complete it and send it in. If you don't have the records, you'll be up for a lot of searching of receipts and other stuff. <laughs> um, so fill it out, send it in. Our team works through the input sheet. We often have some feedback questions and in terms of clarifications, and then we send a report back. Farms that are really interested, um, we are available to meet with them. So we could have follow-up calls or follow-up visits if that's desired. We don't have to. In terms of the field-based uh, materials, um, the adaptive management policy requires yield measuring, and that is uh, a, a bit of a stumbling block for some. If you have yield monitors, you will gather yield data on the go. If you drive trucks over skills, you will have field-based level information, which is all helping with, with that process. Um, so that's probably a slower adoption. The field balances that we're developing now does not require going back to the field. So that will, that will take a barrier away. 
in terms of we don't have to go back and take C's and T's. Uh, it's not part of the policy right now. We're exploring what that could be with our committees. Um, so I don't know, but at the minimum, I would say one day a year. Uh, if they want to be more involved, uh, we can make it a lot more than that. <laughs> So of your 80 firms that you have currently engaged, how many of them are actively experimenting versus how many of them are sort of following your recommendations? That I don't know. I, there's, there's a lot of experimenting going on in, in naturally on farms, like management changes. I uh, don't have a good sense of how many would be doing on-farm experiments or other ways of, of evaluating. Keep in mind with the numbers I'm telling you right now, those are the ones we get to see. So there will be plenty of opportunity for farms to uh, pick up some of these tools and us not being involved in it. Peter, do you want to ask your question? Yes, Karine, thanks for a great presentation. Uh, I was just wondering if you can say a little bit about how you address uh, both at the farm scale and the field scale, how you address crop nitrogen fixation and soil mineralization, soil and supply. So right now, most of uh, the, the the big uh, supplies of nitrogen are for corn for crops that actually need the nitrogen. So, and fixation is is not part of that right now. Um, in terms of the mass balance, we are including and fixation as a category, but it is uh, listed separately on the mass balance. And that is done because we only want to include uh, things we can measure with some level of certainty. So the end fixation component, if a farm has alfalfa or soybeans in their rotation is listed separately as sort of a a range, it's between zero and the max that a plant can fix, just because that number is so uncertain. So that's usually a discussion point if a farm comes back with a negative balance, but they have alfalfa, then we say, okay, take a, we take a look at the alfalfa and fixation and you're doing okay. Um, and mineralization, soil and supply. In the mass balance approach, we are looking at imports versus exports and everything in the middle is is subject to management, accumulation, and loss. Um, at the whole farm level, that is that is the only thing we need at this stage because that identifies when there is an opportunity and that gets us thinking and discussing and exploring what the options might be for making changes. In terms of the field balances, we are now working with farms to develop yield stability zones that identify where the soil and supply is potentially higher uh, compared to other parts of that field or other fields. So that's a, a uh, item that is um, adjustable as we move forward, the soil and supply. And we're learning more about that now through our yield mapping, yield stability zones with the farms. It is absolutely given that the highest yielding fields or the highest yielding areas need the least amount of nitrogen per unit of output. And our recommendation system recognizes that. Okay. That's great, thank you. Just a, uh, another quick thing on the in inputs. Do you consider uh, atmospheric deposition? Uh, that would be, you know, relatively modest uh, in most locations. But as we, I think as we tighten up the management of nitrogen, it's, I wonder if you think about that. And then in some, you know, li livestock areas, there could be local emission and deposition of ammonia that might be more important part of the end balance. So at the whole farm uh, mass balance level, the end deposition is listed as a estimate also, uh, together with end fixation, other nitrogen sources. Um, in this whole farm mass balance tool, our focus was really on what can we manage directly at the farm level. So that's the reason why it's listed as recognizing that there is some nitrogen that comes from the air. Um, but we focus on 
the things we can actually change at the farm level directly, like feed imports, like fertilizer decisions. I want to thank you both for your great presentations today. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.